pacing. Pacing our RPGs. Monty Cook had referred to pacing as being the most important skill that a GM can master. And it is getting pacing right is very much an advanced GMing skill. Knowing how to keep things moving at the right pace, knowing how to twist the beats. I have a chapter on it in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. I've written about it many times on Sly Flourish. I've done other videos on it. I think it is a topic always worth coming back to and thinking about and discussing. And when we are looking at products, when we're looking at adventures, when we're looking at our own notes or how we're operating, I think it's really worth talking about and thinking about pacing that you know how does this affect pacing what's their expectation for pacing is this is the pacing built up front or is it something i now have the tools to improvise while i'm running my game all of those questions are there and and this came up for a couple of reasons one is i had an interesting game on wednesday night where i f- i was thinking more about pacing and seeing what the pacing of that game was like and where it was high and where it slowed down and where it kind of evened out Uh, And also was part of a discussion on my uh, Sly Flourish Patreon Hero Tier podcast called Readings and Reflections. Hero Tier subscribers to Patreon uh, get a weekly podcast called Readings and Reflections where I read the most recent Sly Flourish article and reflect upon it and dive deep into it. And I did so. And that brought this topic up as well. The article that I talked about was called How Many Rounds of Combat Are Ideal? You can see the article directly on Sly Flourish. You can also get it by subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter. You can't get it now because it's not going out in the newsletter. But future ones you can get by subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter, which you should do in the show notes. And the whole thing about how many rounds of combat are ideal, the thing in my readings and reflections that I talked about was that it's actually, that's that's endemic of another question, which is how do you, what's the right pacing for the game and how does that work? And the idea that there are an ideal number of rounds of combat and spoiler, there are not, but if there were, the reason why there would be is because of pacing, that you would think that, oh, that, that's the right number of rounds of combat to fulfill a enjoyable battle where it's not too easy and boring and it's not so hard that it's a slog. But the reality is that whether something's so easy that it's boring or whether it's too hard as a slog really doesn't come down to the number of rounds of combat. It comes down to other features, and that's what I kind of wanted to dive into. The same question exists when you talk about things like how many encounters should there be in an adventuring day? And there isn't a, there isn't an answer to that either, in my opinion. There, there are, and there are systems, and people have talked about how many, and usually they're talking about like attrition of resources as the important thing for something like how many encounters in an adventuring day. But that doesn't have anything to do with how fun the game is or what the pacing is. And that's why I think it's, when you think about pacing, it's more, to me, It's more important to give yourself as a GM the tools and the capabilities to work with the pacing of the game while you're running it than it is to try to map out the pacing of the game before you run it. So John Four over at Role Playing Tips has a has a topic that he's talked about pretty much as long as I've been talking about like eight steps for Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. He's been talking about the concept of five room dungeons. This is something that's been picked up elsewhere. I saw recently that Dyson from Dyson Logos, who was here in our Twitch chat a little while ago, I don't know if he's still here, but he built dungeons uh, that are built around the five room dungeon idea. And the five room dungeon idea is essentially a model for pacing that when you look at what a five room dungeon has that the five room dungeon breaks things down into five different encounter types that are chained together and those are an entrance and guardian a puzzle role-playing challenge a trick or setbacks a climax and a reward and if you think about that it's like a high a lower pacing a dip then another big high and then another dip and it creates this you know sine wave kind of cycle and that's intention is to you know that that intention that that is intended to build a pacing for the game that you can prep for he and i talked about this actually john four and i have a series of videos that we did together where we talked about five room dungeons and i was trying to dig into the idea of like how would you improvise five room dungeons or how do you sort of keep the model in mind but but bring it out while the characters are going different paths because an issue with the five room dungeon is it assumes that you go into room one two three four and five you don't go from room one to room four but then you get like your jayquay style dungeons your jayquay style dungeons where they can go any direction they want then how do you do the pacing that way so we had some thoughts about that we had some videos but 
so so there's a lot of ideas about how to model the game to kind of have the pacing built in that idea of having a set number of rounds in, in a battle the idea of having so many battles per adventuring day the idea of things like five room dungeons you know there's other other ways that people are are building pacing into the prep work to make for that fun game but I'm a bigger believer in the idea that giving yourself the tools to improvise pacing is more important because you just don't know what things are going to be like. And sort of this, this is sort of a parallel to the way that encounter building works, where I've talked about the lazy encounter benchmark, which is this way of kind of determining if you're in the red uh, with how many monsters you throw at your characters, depending on the situation in the game. And it's a very loose system. It doesn't matter how many times I say this, that it's a very loose system that's really only intended to give you a rough gauge of whether an encounter might be inadvertently deadly. People still use it as a system and they still use it to do math and calculations and stuff like that, which you can do. You know, you, it's not that it's wrong, but they forget step one, which is pick the monsters that make sense for the situation first and then use the benchmark to see if you went overboard. It's not a it's not a currency system. It's not designed to be a system that where you build encounters from it. It's designed to be a benchmark that you use to test the encounter before you run it in the same way that there's so many other variables that affect how challenging an encounter is going to be like terrain, magic items, synergy between characters, experience of the players all different kinds of things. It's, it's like I, There's a whole bunch of them. We talk about this a lot in Forge of Foes, that there's a lot of different ways that an encounter can be challenging other than the challenge rating of the monsters, the number of monsters, the level of the characters, and the number of characters. And the same is true when you're talking about things like pacing, that the, there's there are many variables that are going to determine the pacing of your game that you won't know until you're running it. Like, how late is it? Or how's the timing of the rest of the adventure going? Are we carb crashing right now? Did one of the players have a bad day? Did they have an argument? Did they roll significantly poorly when they thought they might roll well? You don't know what's going to happen. That's going to change the feeling and the pacing of the game until you're in it. And then when you're in it, you want to have the tools to say, wow, everybody's kind of tired or this scene didn't play out like I expected it to. And everyone's kind of bummed. I need to be able to add some excitement here. And, you know, you need to have those tools on hand, I think, to be able to change those things. Wow, I thought this battle was going to be really fun, but now it's just a slog. Or I thought this battle was going to be really challenging and they just ate through everything way too easily. What are the tools that you have to help you maintain a pace with this whole thing i think is is really important when i was talking about the game i had on wednesday the interesting thing is i had a really strong start a really cool dwarven forge really fun why don't i show it because i can show off i'm allowed to show off it was cool you know so i had this really fun dwarven forge layout they the characters when they saw it, they go i find it very concerning that this whole thing surrounds this giant bottomless pit but the bottomless pit looked really cool. And I'll give you a hint. When you put a bottomless pit in the center of your battle environment, two out of three times, it's the monsters that are going to go in there. Maybe four out of five times, it's the monsters that are going to go in there. So I definitely, my, my wife with her barbarian, her bear, bar, bear folk barbarian, Bruno, loves grabbing bad guys and throwing them into pits and managed to do so a couple of times. I believe there was a necromancer. She wasn't a necromancer. What was she? She was like a evil, eh, was she a necromancer? I don't think so. She was like an evil spellcaster, evil sorceress, like a necrotic sorceress, ghoul, Darakul. And I believe it, well, I can't remember. I think it was Bruno who grabbed her and threw her into the pit. You can see where she went up on, right next to the pit in order to get an angle on the other character, on the other, on the other characters. And Bruno went and grabbed her and she rolled a two on her athletics check. And he rolled a, or Bruno rolled like a 23. And I was like, it's like picking up a bag full of sticks. Like, a, it's like, you know, it's like you're, you know, it's like a small garbage bag full of compost. And he's like, grabbed it, threw it right in. Really fun. So that was high energy, right? A lot of fun. People really enjoyed it. They, they love, there she is right on the edge of the pit. So the people really had the, that fun in that battle. It took about an hour, maybe a little less than an hour for that fight, but it was a really fun, cool Baldur's Gate 3 style Z access, you know, cool terrain, fun miniature fight. And then after that, they had some exploration that was mostly like a conversation with an NPC that didn't really give them a lot of information they didn't already know, no real big choices for them to make, no real decisions for them to make. And that was pretty low energy. And I could tell, like, the energy here is low. And then they moved to the next scene where they had a situation. They knew that they, they had a thing they needed to do. 
they knew the location where they needed to do it. They knew who the inhabitants were and they had to make choices about where they were going to do it. And that act of making those choices is actually not super high energy. It's definitely more engaging. They definitely have a lot of choices that they can make. But there's also a lot of like back and forth and what if we tried this and what if we tried that? And that can get a little tiring too. So, you know, I realized that like afterwards I was thinking about the pacing of the game and I was like, it was really high and then it was kind of low and then it was sort of medium. And, you know, so that, that question of like, do you, can you look at the scenes that you're preparing and say, are there potential, is the potential here for a high scene? Like the high scene is sort of the doing, like planning, learning about is pretty low. The planning is kind of medium. And then the doing part is pretty high, but the doing part often doesn't have a lot of big choices. Sometimes it does, but most of the time it's pretty tactical choices. Hey, we're going to go, we're going to do this thing. We're just getting engaged. And that's your high pace. You're fighting a battle. You know, combat in D&D is definitely like a, usually a pretty high energy thing, but then you can also have beats in there too, where it's high energy at first and then it gets low energy and then so on. So that, that pacing can change uh, a fair bit too. But generally like you can think of your combat scenes are pretty high energy uh, as long as you keep that energy high. And that's why there's so many dials in battles that I have that I offer up to keep your energy high as long as you want it. And then move on when that energy is starting to dive down, like the drop the hit points to the monsters to zero and get them out of the picture fast so that you can move on with the rest of your game. But it's important to think about those games. And I'll tell you like lowest pace, the lowest pace scenes, and these are hard not to do are exposition. Scenes where the characters are just learning things. They meet an NPC and the NPC just vomits forth a whole big dialogue about major stuff. And the most action that the characters are taking is maybe one of the players is writing some notes and they're not making any choices. They're not doing a lot. That's pretty low energy. So those exposition scenes, we want to be really careful with those because they're definitely going to be low paced. Now it's good to do one of those after you have like a big battle. Because it's okay to have some low pace where they're like, hey, I'm going to go grab my dinner real quick while we're here in this exposition. Like you have, you have breaks, right? And then, you know, then the kind of exploration Then when they have high tension, that can be pretty high pace. So, you know, it's important to look at these different scene types and, and see where it's going to go. And then there's another major piece to this that I, that I was thinking about, which is when most of the time you, you may not have to do anything at all. That when you're running your game and you're at the game, you may not have to do anything. That the pacing takes care of itself. What happens, happens. People are happy. There's almost a natural system. I remember Robin, Robin Laws, who talked about Robin's Laws. He, he wrote Hamlet's Hit Points, which talk about upward and downward beats. And in that book, he says, like, by the time you've internalized this, you, may, you maybe you already, already have internalized these ideas of upward and downward beats. And you don't even think about them. You just, they're just done. But certainly, like, once you start thinking about them, once you start using them, eventually they fall back. You don't need to use them. The game just follows that way. That Because you, as a GM, are experienced. You kind of know how to keep the pacing up, and you just do it anyway. And you know when to put your upward and downward beats because that you just can feel it. You just feel how that works. And I think that that is really good, which means that probably much of the time you don't need to do anything. The game just goes the way the game goes. But then on occasion, you want to steer it. Um, there are occasions where the mechanics of the game or the situation of the game or something in the game has steered the, the, the pacing down the wrong path. And that's when you want to hang onto the wheel and give it a little tug and, and, and move the direction back towards the pacing that matches. It's like ending a battle early, throwing a battle in if things are getting too quiet, making sure you're putting some important decisions in front of the characters if they don't have it you know, ta tapping into the character's knowledge of something instead of just giving exposition, you know, finding, finding these ways, those are important. But, and there are, there are a few areas like this in our role-playing games where we can just sort of have our hands off the wheel and let the game go forward as it's going. And only occasionally you have to grab it and kind of steer it towards it. And another example is like realism versus kind of realism versus fun, which isn't a di it's a false dichotomy that realism is often fun, but sometimes realism leads down a path that isn't fun. And then we want to lean towards fun. So when you're thinking about like what makes sense, this is my most common, one of my most common pieces of advice for running a role-playing game is what makes sense given the story and the fiction in the game. How many monsters you choose is not based on how much uh, resources you want to take away from the characters. It is about what makes sense in the game. What, what, what kind of monsters would they face here? What number of monsters would they face here? Would they be hostile or not? Like that, 
you, you kind of say what makes sense given the situation. And that could be for bigger situations. That could be for NPC interactions. That could be for combat. It could be any aspect of the game. How does the trap work? What makes sense? And then based on what makes sense, the players determine, you, you run with that and you see where it goes. And then only if you see like, wow, that's what makes sense, but boy, it sucks. And no one's having fun with this. That's when you say, okay, I'm going to put my hand in and we're going to steer it towards areas that are more fun rather than what makes sense. Like I've heard DM say like, well, that's what would have happened. And you're like, yeah, but nobody enjoyed it. You didn't enjoy it. The players didn't enjoy it. Nobody liked it. Why? Why? You know, we control the world really, right? We could have made that less arduous than it was. So that's something to consider as well. That, that generally speaking, when it comes to pacing, most of the time you can have your hands off, but occasionally you need to go in and be able to steer it. And it's worth knowing what tools you have available in order to help steer it. So I hope that was kind of a useful conversation. The topic of pacing is going to be, I'm going to talk about it forever. I don't think there's ever an end solution. I don't think we ever just nail it and everything is perfect. I think this is always something that we can improve on and something I like to, to talk about from time to time. 